I think there's tremendous uh, joy when these patients do well, and there can be tremendous dissatisfaction, regret when they don't. Um, and anything we can do to make sure there's more joy and less regret is really, really important. And it's, it's important on a micro level. You know, we want our patients, um, I think, to all do very, very well on an individual basis. But the whole field of neuromodulation, and particularly DBS, um, the time it takes a, a, a patient to come to this decision to have us intervene in their lives is extraordinarily long, extraordinarily long. And probably plastic surgery is about the only thing you would compare it to. So incredible timeline to make the decision, a lot of expectation when it happens, a lot of meticulous steps that have to be gone through to make it go right, and a lot moving forward in terms of making sure nothing goes wrong. So I don't, I don't want to overstate how big a deal it isn't, but there is a very micro level in terms of patient care, but it takes one patient who does poorly to talk to their peers, and the field actually does get pushed back. Everything we work hard, we have all worked for, for all practitioners, neurologists, neurosurgeons, et cetera. So that's why this is actually very important to me. Um, so I'm going to try to go through this pretty quickly. And this, is, I guess, is more pearls and vignettes than anything else. Um, and I would say I'd break it into these basic four categories and the things that I do and have done since 2002 to try to move as close as I can to the best operation that doesn't fail. But I, I'm never going to get there, but I still like trying to get there. So this would be true, I think, of any of the groups of people who are here. We all have teams that have great neuropsych, great neurologists, I think very good neurosurgeons. And we have all these tools, a lot about what we're talked about today. We have multiple techniques. We have incredible technology that's improved. And I never go in with any patient with an expectation of exactly what I'm going to use awake, asleep, GPI, STN. Of course, I'm going to be advised by neurologists who can twist my arm for a particular target. I might argue with them. But I really have to get to know my patient and really understand what their expectation is. So of course, the neurologist's advisement is very important. Um, so is neuropsych. And I really just taking the time to peruse that neuropsych eval and understanding maybe some of the underlying issues. Um, I really want to understand the patient's journey. I don't want to be in the room with them any more than any surgeon does too long, but I also want to understand how they went from not wanting DBS to wanting DBS, right? What they think this is going to bring to their life that's being slowly taken away. That goes a long way down the road in terms of avoiding complications, okay? Um, as I said before, I think you're tailing your operative tools to meet the patient. There's clearly patients who I know I can help who I have to put asleep because they are simply not going to tolerate the awake or experience. Having said that, I would love to have a healthy 40-year-old with no medical disease except Parkinson's disease be awake and cooperate with me in the operating room. Go, gee, those MERs sound great. Let me do as much testing as you need. But that's not really how it usually goes, right? But do I get advised by MER tremendously? It gives me a level of confidence. But I also have to say to a patient up front, I'm going to be limited somewhat because you are going to be sound asleep, in my opinion. But this is what the trade-offs are for doing that. Okay? It's kind of an under-promise and over-deliver situation. Okay? This has been tremendously helpful. Um, and this is kind of the partnership with the patient. This is, And I'm happy to show it to anybody. Uh, one of our former nurse practitioners, Peggy Short, who really helped start the program here in 2000, put together about a 35-page manual that Ryder and I use with our patients. And it's an exhaustive, it's available online too. It's sort of an exhaustive, frequently asked questions guide for the patient and their families. But really, it gets ahead of so many things that a patient can do to threaten their own recovery, near-term and long-term, right? Make sure that they're really engaged, their family is. And a huge time saver in the clinic, right? I don't really want to see a patient until they've spent some time with us in understanding what the philosophy of the program is, risk and benefit, expectation, et cetera. So I'm sure most of the surgeons in the room have been abused by their colleagues that they do DBS, right? How'd your surgery go? <laughs> Didn't that sound good? 
Hej. And that's for those of you who don't know, that's the microelectric recording. Okay? But sadly, it turns us on. Okay? But I would also say there are so many little things about this surgery and the process that actually, I, I like this Andy Warhol quote because I think it's very true about this. Okay? If you don't pay attention to the little things in this process, it will bite you in the rear end. Okay? So let's talk about complications now. Okay? So these are the biggies I worry about. I'm sure you all worry about them too. I don't think there's anything in here that's going to be new or groundbreaking. Okay? Obviously, patient distress, non-cooperation anxiety gets eliminated with a patient asleep. We surgeons like that. Okay? So I think part of the movement to asleep, if I can be quite frank, is surgeons get old and they get grumpy and they get less enthusiastic about talking to their patients. <laughs> and they want to show that the efficacy is just the same when they're asleep. I didn't really mean that, but that's actually really important to understand. Okay? So how I get to in it, how do I, how do I try to avoid inaccurate targeting? Well, I put the use of the phantom up there. I don't use the phantom because I've made a mistake using the phantom. It seems impossible, but it's not impossible. So I don't use it, but some people, very important for them to do. I think this is an important one, and, and it's interesting for bilateral surgery. Never anywhere in the operating room do I put the coordinates for both the left and the right side up at simultaneously. Okay? Um, I have been involved in a case as an observer and seen one coordinate from left switched into right, and it didn't go quite as well as planned. Okay? Which is why if I'm doing a bi it's basically, are we all agreeing we're on the left side? We're all triple checked it. Don't show me the right, and don't put anything up on that board until I say it's okay to do that. So really simple, but important. I think both Ryan and I noticed that the cannulas were sort of taking a beating. Okay? I don't think that explains the, that evil curve we see in our electrodes when we remove the cannula, but I think this has been solved in great part to the disposable cannulas now. But I mention this more for just looking at every little picky piece of equipment. It's almost like you just can't help yourself again to make sure that all these little details are nailed. Okay? And that's, I'm using the can as an example of that. Okay? So my issues with hemorrhage really revolve more around anesthesia. And um, my problems have related to anesthesiologists who I don't want to bash here at all who have done this at other places, and this is how they do it. And, but I'm always harping them in about the, on the blood pressure, both too high and too low. I say, if you're going to pass the baton to a new anesthesiologist, make sure you know this is the most important thing you do for me. Okay? And then I push that too much, and then they drop the pressure so low that someone had a seizure on the table with a burr hole already open. So I think it's, it's sort of the right sort of balance to say, I know this is a simple case. No one likes to do DBS, but really, this is the place where you can really help me. Okay? We all know to avoid skiving the lateral ventricle, not only because of the venous structures that are there, but I have had a ventricular subdural fistula from going through the ventricle. So now I've had a subdural collection around the electrode, which had to be revised. So I don't think the ventricle is anybody's friend, and I think it also avoids complications. So there's a lot of debate about what you do when you see a cortical vein. We know the old teaching about any vein in front of the coronal suture. We know that's a little ridiculous. I think it, it's sort of your judgment. I will drill another burr hole if I think there's a cortical vein that's too big, or certainly if I have a venous lake, I'll just do that. Um, because I just don't think it's worth it. And I think, again, that's, that's sort of a gut call what you see and you decide. But even though I might pick my trajectory very carefully off an MRV, still with the way the head's positioned, I can have a, an unpleasant vein right there underneath me. Okay. I believe in cortical barriers to stop running. I use gel foam. I leave it in. Okay? That comes from a little bleeder in the skin that made its way through the cap, in through the burr hole, and became a subdural hematoma. So I have no objection to taking it out. I understand sort of the rationale for doing that. But again, I think I want, I want something there that really prevents heme from going over on, onto the cortical surface. And, and head positioning. I, I've just grown to like people as flat as they can tolerate. Um, that probably also goes to the brain sort of gets pushed. I don't feel there's so much air in train. I believe at least one case I've had an air embolus that we sort of figured out. 
right? That can start, as you all know, from coughing. So a burr hole in a sitting position can cause air embolus. And we probably all had patients start coughing. Now, is that from the propofol? Don't know. But I like a more flat position for my patient. Another reason why I like a sleep surgery, but Parkinson's patients in particular with swallowing issues don't necessarily like that position tipped down, and sometimes they do. Okay. Patient distress, which causes lots of problems. Uh, the nurse practitioner who's in, or physician's assistant who's in any one of our cases really is technical expertise, caregiver, hand holder, but hugely important in making the case go well. I will use in certain cases where I've misjudged the patient's anxiety, use benzodiazepines, even if I think it suppresses tremor, because it's just one of those situations where I think it's important to do, okay? And talking to the patient too, okay? So that's really my plan in surgery, and let's just talk about this other interesting period of time of complication risk and avoiding it. I think most of us get a post-operative CT scan, if not for placement, certainly just to make sure we can feel good about going home, that there's nothing bad going on. Some of us want to refuse our image right away or say, I know where I need to be, but it also advises problems, okay? Um, I think what part of my clinical practice problem has been is they go away, they come back for those IPGs. I'm doing three or four IPGs that day and I'm forgetting that these are pretty sick people who haven't slept well and are not doing particularly well at home, and I haven't really been listening or getting tuned in to their lack of sleep, their low-grade fever, their hyponatremia. So I really think it's a very key, interesting thing to think about is there is this period of time, for those of you who are staging your batteries, and I think most of us are, not every case, but I think the preponderance, what's happening in this three to 14 day period of the patient and is at least someone on the team really getting attuned to that, right? What's, is, is have they been good? Have they slept? Do they get a good honeymoon effect? Cognitive issues, et cetera, okay? So a system in place to reassess the physiologic status prior to IPG placement, okay? It can save some headache and some heartache, okay? Um, so a little bit about long-term complications, and I, I know that most of the neurologists and neurosurgeons have seen this, and this is a classic case two weeks ago where I get a call from a patient who's coming in from Alaska. And uh, for those of you who have been in Alaska, Alaska's a beautiful place, but there really are some very remote areas, and people get Parkinson's disease in really remote areas, and in some ways, they can be huge beneficiaries of DBS. But also, you really talk about really arm's length away. So a very nice guy who had DBS three years ago, tremor predominant, bilateral STN, PC, great guy, salt of the earth. He calls us and said, well, my primary care doctor said I should probably come in and see you. I said, okay. Um, what's going on? He goes, well, there's just something with my wound. Okay. So, okay. What do you think? He goes, well, they just, it's, it's open. I go, is it red fever? No, I've been doing okay. I didn't even really want to come down, okay? Because it's a, it's a pain to come down from Alaska. So he comes into the clinic, and he's got a dressing on, and he's, his, his TBS is working great. He takes away his bandage, and I read Medtronic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So... Really stunning. The, the physiology of the human being is quite amazing, right? I go, at what point did you think that that was not a good thing? Okay, But not infected, right? Colonized, right? And of course, the, the, my point about this is wound management, you know, IPG placement, we think about anatomy, skin thickness, where we're going to put surgical technique, but there's going to be a longitudinal piece to this too. Now, he was not a thin, cachectic person. He told me he was probably just out chopping a lot of wood and using his arm like this, and it got a little bit, and he didn't really think about it, or suspenders were going over the top. But I mean thick skin, not thin skin, right? Okay? So nothing to really say here, okay? I'm amazed, especially in older women who have thinner skin, how well they've been able to tolerate IPGs. 
But I will also say to my Medtronic colleagues here, please make something smaller and better, okay? It's just, and I, that's a later discussion, but it's not, it's not the people in this room's fault, but, okay? Obvious too, I really, really make a point to tell them to my point about this guy from Alaska. Um, really think about repetitive motion activities. I think we all have hunters we've taken care of, so we put the IPG on the other side of the shotgun. That's not really what I'm talking about. That's pretty obvious. Uh, I've seen it happen in golfers, tennis players, anybody who's using this trunk up here a lot. I think the flex coil extension has reduced a lot of it, but I also think just something to keep in mind with them to say, think about these activities that you're going to be doing. And I know that doesn't represent every DBS patient, but important. Now, are there any other concomitant diseases or medications that are going to make wound breakdown more likely? As we all know, even many months and years after placement. Okay. Um, the last thing I'll say, and I know every, I know all the surgeons are aware that the FDA sent out a thing about actually making connections and how we're actually messing with leads, we're screwing too tight, or this sort of thing. And this is again going back to the little thing issue. Okay, there's so many little steps. You can just do the most beautiful case and these little steps and just getting this thing hooked up. The people who work with you, I know Carter's probably tired of hearing it from Ryder and I, these little, little things are gonna make such an important difference that seems so se seemingly minuscule compared to just getting the lead in the right place are important. Again, for micro reasons and macro reasons. There, our next slide. Okay, so I think I've talked enough about uh, patient education. Um, but the other thing I would say to leverage too, and this guy who came back from Alaska is gonna, to a certain degree, I really wanna change the way we practice, at least my practices. Um, I think we do have to leverage with our patients, if nothing else, as surgeons, just a process by which they're checking in, okay? Um, wounds, how they're doing, where their battery is, you know, to, to Jonathan's point of, I don't want the call at, you know, with 24 hours notice that the battery's dying and the family all just came in from out of town and we said you could get it done, right? This e-surveillance with pictures, et cetera, I think is important. So for my Alaska patients now, if there's any question, I want a picture on their iPhone sent to us, right? It's so simple. It's so easy. To, heck, we can FaceTime them. That is one good thing about Technologies, you can leverage it to these very remote places to be able to do that. Again, trying to reduce the risk of complication, okay? So, um, <laughs> lazy surgeons, I'll tell you what. Um, very parochial, and that's the way I wanted it. But again, this is just a process of all learning from each other and being in the OR with Jonathan two weeks ago, he showed me one thing I'd never thought of, but I'm not telling any of you other surgeons. You got to go visit. <laughs> I said, "Damn, I've done a lot of these cases for the last 15 years. I never thought of the most stupid, easy thing right in front of me." I'm not going to tell you what it is, John. You're going to have to remember, okay? <laughs> and that's really important. Thank you.